We'll move on to our final talk of the uh, day today. Um, Cheryl Morgan is going to be joining us to speak about Michael Dillon, um, who comes from Bristol. Thank you, Cheryl. Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Leeds, for inviting me to come and talk today. I am indeed going to be talking about Michael Dillon, although he didn't actually come from Bristol. He was actually uh, Irish by uh, ancestry and was born in London, but he lived in Bristol during the Second World War, which is when he underwent his gender transition. So let's see if we can share the old screen here. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about Dylan's time in Bristol and how gender transition was different back in the 1940s than it is today. And I will be shamelessly using my position as speaking last to reference some of the earlier talks we've uh, had. I mean, for example, Dylan's transition is very different from Katie's, which took place only a few years back. So first of all, let's introduce our star character. This is Michael. Uh, as I said, Michael's ancestry was Irish, but uh, was born to a noble family, a baronet, and obviously with that background went to Oxford. And this photograph here shows Michael during his time at Oxford, um, assigned female at birth, still having to go to an all girls college at Oxford, but very much presenting as male. This is a photograph from Dylan's time as captain of the Oxford Ladies Rowing Club. And he did actually stand up for women's sport at that time, which was uh, good of him, but we'll come back to that later. Now, Dylan, of course, had no references whatsoever. Uh, he would have been five years old when Lily Elba first uh, had any surgeries. He would have been eight when the Nazis closed down Magnus Hirschfeld's clinic in Berlin. There were other trans men who'd undergone some form of medical transition before him, Alan Hart in the USA, and Karl Baer in Germany, but there's no way that Dylan would have known about this. So he pretty much had to invent everything himself. Now, when he left university, life became very different. He had to exist in normal society. He got a job at what he described as a medical laboratory in South Gloucestershire. And he discovered that there was somebody living locally in Bristol that might be able to help him. So George Foss was a GP, but also a keen scientist, and he was an expert in reproductive medicine and the like. And he wanted to experiment with a brand new drug that had only been available for a few years called testosterone. Now, being a man of his time, Dr. Foss thought that this masculine drug that he had here might be useful for controlling those uh, weak and irregular female bodies and getting them back in order again. So he tried prescribing it for women's menstrual problems. This did not go well. The lady patients had side effects, which they didn't like. So Foss, being a good doctor, immediately stopped the experiment and wrote it all up for The Lancet to warn everybody else not to try this. And that's probably where Dylan saw it and thought, you know, those side effects, they might be just what I need. So he went to see Foss. And initially, Foss was very keen to carry on the experiment with a willing patient. But of course, he had his medical ethics to worry about, uh, do no harm and all that sort of stuff. So he asked Dylan if he would see a psychiatrist just to confirm that Dylan was sane. And this went very, very badly. Uh, the psychiatrist treated the whole thing as a complete joke. Not only did he recommend that Foss have nothing further to do with Dylan, but he also gossiped to all his friends about it, and it got back to people at Dylan's workplace. Dylan, uh, later in life, was very scathing about the role of psychiatrists and psychologists in gender medicine, and uh, didn't want them involved in that sort of stuff at all. Foss tried to be sympathetic. Um, he gave Dylan a bottle of testosterone pills, but said, look, if you take those, it's at your own risk. Please don't bother me again. And shortly after that, he got called up for military service. So that was the last that they saw of each other. Now, because of the gossipy psychiatrist, Dylan needed to find new work. Fortunately for him, all of the men were starting to go off to war and there were a lot of jobs that were previously reserved for men that women could now apply for. So he got a job as a forecourt attendant 
had a garage in central Bristol called College Motors. It was a luxury car dealership, you know, selling all the, the latest models to rich clients. Now, just like many trans people today, Dylan had difficulties with his co-workers. They were completely bemused by this apparent young woman who behaved like one of the boys, and they used to make fun of him and play pranks on him. However, Dylan's boss found that he was useful because Dylan had an upper-class accent and upper-class manners, and that was an extremely valuable asset if you're in the business of selling luxury cars to rich people. So the boss regarded Dylan as an asset and instructed the rest of the workers not to do anything that might out Dylan to the clients. Dylan also made one friend at work, a young man called Gilbert Barrow. He's a teenager at the start of the war, too young to be called up for military service. And he was looking for work and came to the garage and Dylan befriended him. They became close friends and uh, remained friends for the rest of their lives. Both of them worked as what was called fire watch. That is, they slept in the garage overnight in case there was an air raid and they needed to do anything like put out fires and so on. Now you can imagine that a garage is a pretty dangerous place to be during an air raid. You've got enormous quantities of petrol being stored in tanks uh, under the ground or whatever. And if you were hit by a high explosive, you would go up in smoke. Fortunately, the garage itself was never hit. But in 1941, the Luftwaffe put on their largest ever raid on Bristol as a special welcome gift for Winston Churchill, who was due to make a speech there the next day. In the course of this raid, a high explosive fell on a print works, which was just up the hill from the garage where Dylan and Barrow were sleeping, and the sky became full of burning paper. So, of course, they had to do something about it. They would have been woken up by the air raid sirens, and it so happened that the garage had a large number of tyres stored in a house at the top of a place called Christmas Steps. It's a very sh steep shopping uh, lane in Bristol. And, um, you can see the photograph of it there. And Dylan went up to the top of the lane and got the tyres out of the house. And he was rolling them down the hill to Barrow, who was catching them and piling them up so that they could get them back into the garage. It was a very hair-raising evening for the two of them. But, yeah, trans man, bit of an action hero. Well done, Michael. Now, unfortunately, um, Barrow got called up to the Navy shortly after that, but Dylan continued life at the garage and he made one more lifelong friend in Bristol. It was a clergyman. Now, that, nowadays, we often see conflict between trans people and religious figures. But this particular clergyman, the Reverend Arthur Russell Milbourne, who was canon of Bristol Cathedral, was clearly very sympathetic to the plight of trans people. He and Dylan became friends. They used to discuss theology a lot, even when later in life, Dylan became a Buddhist monk. And through Dylan, Milbourne made the acquaintance of a pioneering British trans woman called Roberta Cowell, and later wrote the introduction to her autobiography. And Dylan had a lifelong problem with a condition called hypersemia, which is low blood pressure. And quite probably the uh, restricted diet that people had during the war would have made that worse. He occasionally had fainting fits. And in 1942, he collapsed in the street and was taken to the Bristol Royal Infirmary. This caused a great deal of interest amongst the doctors because they brought in somebody who appeared to be a young man and then on examination appeared not to be a young man. So probably much excitement amongst all the doctors and most importantly, Dylan met a plastic surgeon. He doesn't name him, but we believe that this was a chap called Jeffrey Fitzgibbon. And we're fairly confident about that because he was the senior plastic surgeon in Bristol at the time. Whoever this person was, they decided to befriend Dylan and try and help him out in his life and offered to perform top surgery. Dylan immediately says, yeah, go for it. And therefore top surgery happened. Now, these sort of things tended to be done off the books in those days. Um, but nevertheless, Dylan got something that was really important to him. And he also got an introduction to Sir Harold Gillies, who was mentioned earlier today by Dr. Sadegi. And we'll hear a lot more about him in a little while.
Now, having had the top surgery, Dylan then tried to find out what next he could do. And there wasn't really much in the way of a roadmap that he could follow. Remember, he, he didn't know of any other trans people. But it was much easier in those days to change your legal gender. And that is thanks to intersex people. Intersex people have been well known to medicine for some time. And back in the 1930s, there had been a doctor at Charing Cross Hospital in London called Lennox Broster, who had made a career of working with intersex people. Now, in those days, intersex wasn't quite as, as well known in, for um, maternity purposes. And quite often, intersex babies were misassigned at birth. And as they grew up, it became obvious that a mistake had been made. And some of these people ended up going to see Lennox Broster and having their legal gender changed. Mark Weston, who is one of the icons of this year's LGBT History Month, is one of Broster's patients. So you could get your legal gender changed if you got a letter from a doctor saying this person was incorrectly assigned at birth. Dylan found a friendly GP in Bath who was willing to do this for him. And consequently, he could write off to Somerset House and get a new gender and a new name. And he then took that to the Labour Exchange in Bristol and got new ID for everything. It's much easier than the Gender Recognition Act, although, of course, the Gender Recognition Act is based on the same idea, the concept that a mistake has been made at birth and the person should have been assigned at a different gender. Having been reassigned as a man, of course, Dylan was immediately called up for military service, but fortunately for him, you had to go through a medical before you were accepted, and the people doing the medical took one look at Dylan's body and said, no, we're not having you anywhere near the armed services, go back to your day job. Now, armed with his new name and gender, and with the garage wanting to uh, not let anybody know what was going on, Dylan was able to do what we call living in stealth. So he just carried on with his life as a man. And he decided with all this interaction he had with medical people, that he wanted to become a doctor. His university background didn't include any scientific training. So he needed to get some qualifications in science. And he signed up with the Merchant Venturers College in Bristol, where he could get some qualifications. And he'd later graduate from Trinity College Dublin and spend much of his life working as a doctor. We come back now to Sir Harold Gillis. He was the head of the UK's plastic surgery service. He'd been given that job by the government when the war started and he was uh, given a teaching hospital and told to get all of the brightest young surgeons in the country to train them up in his techniques so that when the wounded started coming back from the front, they could do something for these poor people. Geoffrey Fitzgibbon was one of the people who had studied under him. So that was how the introduction got made. Now, Dylan, wanting to be a doctor, volunteered to work as an intern at Gillies Hospital during the war, um, in his weekends, in his time off. And in return, Gillies volunteered to develop a technique for phalloplasty, for the creation of a penis through plastic surgery. And as far as we're aware, this is the first time ever this happened. Dylan had at least 13 separate operations. He, re he records 13 in his autobiography. Uh, Gillies, I believe, says there were 17. So it was really very much a, a hit and miss thing at the time. Um, must have been a lot of trauma. Uh, thankfully, it's a lot easier for trans men now. But Dylan, being a pioneer, had to go through all of that. Now, having been a pioneer and knowing nothing about trans people in the wider world, Dylan decided to write a book. In fact, he wrote most of it while he was actually living in Bristol in his nights being firewatch for the garage. And it's called A Study in Ethics and Endocrinology. It doesn't talk about trans people at all because Dylan didn't have the terminology. He knew nothing about Magnus Hirschfeld. However, the medical pathway that he recommends for what we now call trans people was decades ahead of his time. Earlier on, Dr. Sadegi talked about uh, Harry Benjamin, who is an American doctor who set up a famous clinic in the States to deal with trans people. 
And Benjamin did an awful lot of good. Uh, many of his patients were really, really happy about what he'd done for them. But the pathway that he created was very medicalized and very much dependent on diagnosing trans people as insane. When I transitioned back in the 1990s, I had to be diagnosed as insane before I could get treatment. Right? And that view has carried on up until relatively recently. It was only three years ago that the World Health Organization officially released uh, a document saying, no, trans people are not insane. Uh, and they're just a natural variation in human beings. And there are still many GPs in Britain who refuse to accept that trans people are not insane. Dylan, on the other hand, is recommending a patient-centered approach. He says, listen to the patient, see what they tell you. They are the experts on their own mind. He knew a little bit about brains and he understood that you couldn't experiment on people's brains to try to change the way that people thought that would be incredibly difficult. So why not change people's bodies instead? That was much easier. Uh, in fact, it was something he'd done, although he didn't actually confess that in the book. Um, one final piece of information about Michael, and that's his relationship with Roberta Cowell. Uh, dating for trans people was even more risky back then than it is now. But having written this book, um, Dylan then came to the attention of people who thought he might be able to help them. And Roberta was one such person. Dylan probably assisted with some of her surgery because removal of the testicles was illegal in the UK at the time. Harold Gillis couldn't have done that for her or he'd have been struck off. So we believe that Dylan actually performed that operation at his home so that Roberta could then go on and have her vaginoplasty operation. And Dylan fall, fell madly in love with Roberta and had dreams of marriage and having a little woman at home who would do dinner parties for his doctor friends and all that sort of thing. Roberta, on the other hand, had read his book in which he says some horribly misogynist things about how women are much too emotional to be allowed into academia and so on, which for somebody who'd been to an all women's college at Oxford is a bit of a disgrace, really. So she turned him down and that was the last they saw of each other. But I think that the thing that I've taken away most looking at these two pioneering trans people is how desperately they tried to fit in to the society at the time. Dylan took on this persona of the, the 1950s patriarchal man, uh, not wanting women to have any important role in society. Cowell throughout her life insisted that she was not a trans person, that she was intersex and much of the changes in her body were occurring naturally. Both of them were desperate to deny that they were trans uh, in various ways. And at least now that element of shame has, has been taken away and people are able to be publicly trans and we can be proud of who we are. So although there were some things easier in the 1940s, I think that's one key thing that we have different today and we need to hold on to. And that's me done. How are we doing for questions, Hannah? Thank you so much. That's really, really great. Um, I will give people a couple of minutes to uh, write their question down and put them in the uh, chat box or in the question and answer box located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, there we go. I knew there'd be some. Uh, oh, there are a couple of, uh, we'll share these with you afterwards. There are a couple of messages about how great it was, which I also absolutely echo. Um, it was really, really interesting. Um, Neil says that he thinks he's learnt more history today than the past few years. Um, I'm very hopeful that Neil is not still at school, in which case his history teachers will be very mad. Um, here's a question from Kat. Did Michael's faith ever come into play regarding his transition? Um, I think it came in, into play in a, a number of ways. I mean, firstly, his interest in spirituality was very much bound up with his sense of identity, that it, it somehow he felt that he was a male person uh, and that it, you know, whatever divine thing there was, uh, was recognizing him as that. So I, I think from a, both from a Christian and a Buddhist point of view, spirituality and gender were bound up. But more importantly, when he 
applied to become a Buddhist monk, he had a real hurdle to overcome because only men were allowed to become monks. And it took a lot of, of hard work and advocacy on his own part to persuade the monastery to accept him as a man. Thank you. We're getting out by the newspapers by that time, though, so everybody in the world knew. Ah, OK. Um, we're getting a lot of messages about how excellent you are. Um, so <laughs> that's always the dream. Um, yeah. And it turns out Neil is, in fact, not young enough to be at school, which is which is reassuring to teachers everywhere. Right. Um, uh, 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 Sue has put, as ever, amazing, all learn something you speak. Can you say Dylan is a face of LGBT history month? Yeah, he is, yes. Uh, I'm, Dr. Sadeh has already mentioned that once today, but yes, Michael Dylan is one of the five faces or icons of this year's LGBT history month. You can find out more about him on the LGBT history the LGBT History Month website. Uh, and also Mark Weston, who I mentioned, is another one of our icons. Uh, absolutely fascinating story there. Somebody who had uh, uh, competed in the Olympics for Britain as a woman, and then went and saw Lennox Broster and lived the rest of their life as a man. Well, that's definitely worth taking a look into. By the way, if people are interested in Dylan, I'm doing uh, another talk on the 10th through the Emshed Museum in Bristol that will concentrate largely on local history, on places where Dylan lived, people he met, and so on. Fantastic. I uh, didn't realise that was to enable you to give a plug, otherwise I'd have done it much more delicately. Uh, it's We've got a question here that says, it's interesting that Dylan could be quite misogynistic, which I hadn't heard before. Is it important to have uh, faces of LGBT plus History Month like this who were imperfect people and to include that imperfect history? I think everybody is imperfect. You know, if, uh, all of us have got something in our history that, that we ought to be ashamed of having done. Uh, so if, if we're looking at people from the past, we're almost bound to find something that they've done that you could be concerned about. And Dylan, of course, was, was under a lot of pressure to conform to what 1940s society expected of a man. So, you know, how much of what he wrote himself was his own true feelings about women and how much of it was what he, how he was presenting himself as a medical expert um, is hard to say. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, so we've got a whole load more comments about how excellent the presentation was. Um, and I'd just like to really uh, say, excuse me, say thank you very much for uh, that talk. It was really, really interesting. And um, just a question from me. Do we know, is there any documented history around the side effects of Dylan's um, surgeries in that they sounded, as you say, quite traumatic? Do we know if it was successful particularly or whether there were particular side effects? Um, in terms of success, I, I think certainly Dylan was able to urinate through his penis. Uh, and he did spend quite a long time living as a man. Uh, and in fact, living as a man as a ship's doctor. So living in a very closed environment with other men, uh, it would have been um, relatively easy for him to have been exposed. And clearly he wasn't when he was finally outed by the press it was due to his family background, that he was known to, to be the child of this baronet and people looked him up in Debrett's and whatever and said, hang on a minute. So I, I think he was absolutely passing successfully as a man. Um, we don't know whether he would have been a, able to function successfully with regards to sex because it never got tried. Um, but Roberta Cowell said that she didn't fancy it because she viewed Dylan as as one of those trans people, which she didn't regard herself to be. She would have said it would have been a lesbian relationship if uh, they had got married, which was really quite disgusting of her. Yeah, I guess another imperfect historical figure, which, as you've said, is really important for us to document. Um, sure. Well, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us and rounding off our conference so beautifully. 
Um, it's really been a delight to have you here and it's really been a delight um, to begin to understand a little bit more about Michael Dillon. And thank you for correcting me that he does not, in fact, come from Bristol. That was my bad. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it's a good job you people are here to educate me, hey? Yeah, well, we, we had an Irishman on earlier on. I didn't want to take away their national hero. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You do right. So can I also at this point give a real thank you to all of uh, our speakers that we've had so far today. Um, you've all been absolutely incredible. And I know if we were in an actual room, there would be rapturous applause at this point um, because of the fact that obviously you've done such a great job. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone that's watching still for coming. Um, watching Zoom all day is not easy, but hopefully it's been worthwhile for you and you've learned a lot about our LGBT plus history. Um, and then finally, once again, I'd like to say a really big thank you to the team uh, for putting this whole event on. You guys have done an incredible job. Um, John, as always, has been an absolute pillar of organisation. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, and of course, to out in the past more generally for their incredible work over a number of years to make sure that this sort of thing is able to happen. And our children in our education system are able to get decent LGBT plus education. Don't forget that we're going to be sending out that poll and we'll also be sending out um, any little bits of information like links to different speakers or anything like that in case any of you want to follow them, pick up their works or um, have any more to do with them. Thank you.